What's good, everybody? It's the buzz on A Block. Shout out Miami Community Radio. It's Young A. I got Crack Cobain. Yo. It's artist, Sir Nixon. Yo, yo. Yes, sir. So <laughs> it's funny, before we started, we were talking about uh, how we all met, but specifically how Crack and Nix met. And I'm just going to let them go off that note and so we could just open this up. We had a dope performance before, so I hope y'all got a feel for how, who they are and, you know, how they operate. And, yeah, I'm just going give to give it to them. All right, so I first met Nixon in 2012, that summer. Um, he was part of a metal band. And, uh, like, our in-house producer was wow. uh, the... He was the, the uh, basses. The basses. He was the basses and I was playing the drums. And Nixon was was the drummer, and they had two guitar players, both fire. And um, I went to go see them perform, and this man was off of two thirty twos of Mickey's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like they killed a performance. Uh, the guitarists and and the two guitarists, which one of them was uh, the lead singer. Mm -hmm. These men they climbed on top of each other's shoulders. Damn. Playing the guitars and shit. Like, it was a wild show. Jumping off my bass drum. Uh, shit was wild. Face paint and everything. <laughs> so, sick. we uh, get through them performing. Then we went next door to uh, this this pool hall down our way. And everybody's in there drinking. Uh -huh. And me and him got cool just off of that. And he started coming around. Because I was trying to sign the, the whole band. But yeah. they ended up breaking up because of typical band shit, girl problems. Stuff like that. <laughs> it's stuff always like girl that. problems, man. Always girl problems. But um, Nixon would still come around. He would come through, hang out at the house and shit with smoke, just yeah. vibe. And one day he pulls up on me, and um, it's him, uh, Emmy, who's also on ECMG, okay. and, uh, and our producer. And they're like, yo, we got this song. And they play the song. And I'm like, wow. who's that? And he goes, that's me. And I go, oh, shit, nigga, you rap? <laughs> 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 and it was like his first song that he had ever done. And then he just started, like, doing more music and shit. And bro got, got tighter over time. Like, he, wow. but the first song was fire. Like, I'm like, who the fuck is that? You feel me? Like, but that's, like, that's how me and him met. Crazy things. We went to high school together, and we didn't know each other in high school. But we had, like, a lot of friends in common and shit. Yeah, like, everyone I knew, he knew. Everyone he knew, I knew. Uh, he always brings up names. I'm like, oh, yeah, that guy. That, yeah, this and that. And it, it's crazy. Like, we knew everyone, but not each other. Oh. And then we met after high school, and then we started doing the music, and that was it. We just became tight. Oh, so, God, that's what it was. So 2012, that was like, what, how old were you guys? Like, what, what did it look like then? What was the name of the band? Um, the name of the band was Ideals of the Corrupt. Wow. Yeah, we were metal, metalcore, fast metal. We had breakdowns. Uh, we were rowdy. We played house parties. We all played drunk. Uh, it was just wild stuff. One house party we played, the cops came, shut it down. Wow. It was wild stuff. Wild stuff. Yeah, it was crazy. But 2012, we were um, 21 at the time. Okay. I'm like fresh out of college, trying to find my way and shit. And I had a, um, I had a group that I was dealing with before, before I started ECMG. And um, just one of the artists just was on some sloppy shit one day and I like I was already like playing the ECMG yeah. in my head and like I had a book I'm I'm a writer I write everything now okay. so I'm already plotting like how I'm going to form ECMG and um it just so happens that these guys come up to record one dude was like oh I don't got my music I'm like bro you can't record music you don't got your you don't got your lyrics with you <laughs> and he uh he was like sitting down like rewriting and um I went for a walk and I had my I had my engineer with me and he was like bro I can't do this shit and I was like, nah, I feel you. And like, we went back, recorded dudes, they left. And I was like, bro, I wanna show you something I've been working on. And I showed them like, I had the name already. And I was already like building, like how I wanted my team to be. Cause um, the dude that introduced me and me and David, which is our producer, oh. and how I ended up meeting Nixon, yeah. he's a good friend of ours named Dudat. Um, me and him had band class together in high school. Wow. And like, he played he played the drums, he's a percussionist, so he'll be in class playing the bass drums and I'm freestyling. Way the better than I did. <laughs> and I'm talking about the teacher used to hate when we get together because we supposed to be working on music, actually yeah. like playing the songs that he assigned to us and stuff. And we like, man, fuck that music. He beating on the bass drum, I'm in there freestyling. We had other dudes in class that be freestyling. So like I already had in mind, like he he brought everybody together really. Like I was giving credit for that. Cause wow. he um he had ended up moving down the street from me. 
and he'll be at the crib smoking and chilling. Every, bro, everybody used to be at my house. Like, my parents, that's the one thing I could, I could say I like, really appreciate about them. Wow. They said, everybody come over. Nixon could tell you, it'll be days where I'm not at, I'm not at home, and he at my crib. <laughs> like, I, like I come home from work, and I see Nixon chilling on my couch. I'm like, what's up, bro? And he's like, oh, your mom let me in. I'm like, all right, for sure. Yo, for real, and every time I'd go there, the first thing they'd ask me, oh, did you eat today? Here, have some food. That's a fact. Definitely. Every time. Like, Moms and pops, they they going to ask you if you ate something. Damn near acted like my parents, too. And if, they, if you beautiful. didn't eat, you was going to eat. That's love. Man. And they, they like, like Nixon's vegan, and they'll have veggie burgers made for him. Like, bro, when I say they would make sure everybody had something that was filling to them, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, like, what culture are your, are your parents? Um, my mom is from the Virgin Islands, and my dad uh, grew up in the Virgin Islands, but he's from Antigua. So, definitely big Caribbean background. Um, wow. But they raised us on everything. So, like, and when I say everything, I mean, like, as far as, like, just music. Like, my pops put me on the hip-hop. My pops used to listen to Rakim and, and Eric B and shit like that. Yeah. They put me on. Um, my mom was big on R&B. My mom is the reason I love Mariah Carey and stuff like mm -hmm. that now. Um, me and my brother always joked that Saturday mornings, it will start with gospel. And once that Casey and JoJo came on, we knew it was done for the day. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we, after, as soon as we heard that, that all my life, was oh. like, all right, we get to go watch TV now. Yeah. But yeah. And what about you? Like, what was your upbringing? Well, uh, I'm adopted. Uh -huh. But uh, my, my background is of Irish descent. But okay. my adopted parents well I call them my parents they're, they're my parents they're my yeah. mom and my dad yeah. my dad is his side's French and my mom's side was Greek oh yeah but they had this old school um upbringing that they brought me up on at least as far as, far as music so they hated they hated hip-hop they hated death metal and those are my two favorite genres growing up yeah. I love hip-hop and death metal and I'll, I'll be honest they don't need my mom before she even passed she never even knew I did hip-hop Wow. Yeah, and then my dad, he doesn't even know I do hip hop. But they never liked the genre, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't appreciate it. And that's fine. Like, I don't care. As long as they got their love, I don't need their support in hip hop. That's how I feel about it. I but feel that. but uh, I was brought up on, shoot, my dad loves Sinatra. Oh. Sinatra, Dean Martin. Oh, yeah, he put me up on that stuff. And then my mom put me on uh, old school rock, like classic rock, like ACDC, Deep Purple, Ozzy Osbourne. So that's what I grew up with, the music. And then I found, once I found death metal, I, for some reason I like that more. I guess it's because I'm kind of an angry person. <laughs> and I sometimes let the rage get the better of me. And I feel like death metal just helps me. It's weird. It's like it, it meditates me. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I've always loved death metal. Yeah, we got to collab on something because I got a couple metal songs. And I got a couple songs with Phil where I was just going crazy. I'll probably send a few guys after. Like, yeah. I'll be on the raid shit, too. Yeah, yeah I'd be down. I'd be down for all of it. Um, so, speaking of cultures, like, how have you seen the culture transform in music? Um, and how has that, like, it's, shifted bro, it's, your it's perspective? So, it's so different now. I remember, like, when I first got into, to, like, rap, you had to know how to freestyle. You had to write your own lyrics. Like, it was, it was so much rules to it that, like, I feel aren't the same anymore. Yeah. Like, it's to the point now, like, I listen to Double XL freestyles and I don't expect anything. And that sounds crazy, right? Like, no, I feel that though. I feel that though. But it's, it's like, I used to be like, okay, like, I know everybody gonna snap. Now I go in with no expectations because I don't wanna be disappointed. Yeah, the 2011 one, I think that was the best one. That was hard. Yeah. That was, but that was still people that understood the culture from the way that it started. It wasn't just everybody's like flashing the pan. And I feel like that's what it is now. Like, the music is flashing the pan. It's not anybody slow cooking. And the only people that really slow cook is the people that they're like, oh, like, they're boring. It's like, nah, bro, they're not boring. They're actually taking the time to make art that's going to last. Yeah, definitely. And what about you? Like, how have you seen the culture shift in just what you listen to? Or oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, when I got into hip-hop, like, for real, for real, it was back in yeah, 2012, like after I met Crack over here and the band dispersed and I started getting into hip hop and writing, I started going more in depth with it, finding who I like and who I don't like and 
Yeah, it was like homework at my house, bro. You had to listen to everybody. <laughs> yeah. So he yeah. was like, oh, like, who do you listen to? I'm like, bro, you got to go listen to some Big. You got to listen to some Snoop. You got to listen to this one. You got to listen to that one. And bro did his homework, like. No, definitely. Yeah. I listened to, to everything he told me to go listen to. I listened to it. And then I would branch off and find my own people to listen to. And then found a certain subgenre of hip hop that I really like and started delving into that. And then saw all the artists there. And that's when I found my one of my favorite artists to listen to is Mad Child. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's one of my favorites. And Fire. I came up, I came across him in yeah, 2012. That's when I do that came over to the crib. Right. And as soon as he got there, he's like, I got someone that I want you to watch. And I think you're going to like him. And he puts on a Mad Child song called The Devil's Reject. And I watched that. And I was like, dude, this guy is fire. Fire. And that's pretty much who really inspired me to find my, my style in hip hop and go with it that way. And since 2012 to now, like even hip hop has changed since then. Like it's, it's not the same anymore. It yeah, keeps getting my, like peak blog era. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Peak blog, peak blog era. Then we went through the whole SoundCloud wave and fine. And now we, you know, to where we are now. So yeah, it's definitely changed a lot. Like I started rapping in, in 06. Okay. So I'm like, and that's not not even recorded, but just like rapping, like freestyling the cyphers and stuff like that. I wrote my first song in 04, Garbage. <laughs> no bar structure. Damn. But it came from poetry. Like, I used to write poetry all the time. Okay. I used to sell poems in middle school. I was oh. like, Cyrano the Bergy at. Like, you want a poem for your girl, bro? Bring me $5. I'm going to write you a poem. Make sure you yeah, on God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make sure your shit tight, too. So it came from that to um to writing and then... Later on, learning the song structure and freestyling, reading books on it, using yeah. what I learned from band into writing the songs and stuff like that. But yeah, I definitely seen the, the change. Like most of these artists now say they can't even count bars, and it's like, damn, that sucks for you. But I get it. Like, shit, Nori couldn't count bars. Nori, that's why he's the what, 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 what. That was him setting up his bar structure. So when he would go in the booth and record, he knew when to stop. Wow. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I see the shift. And you guys said you went to high school together? Yeah, we went to yeah. uh, Palmetto together. Oh, Palmetto. Yeah, we both went to high school together, but we didn't know each other in high school. <laughs> so you guys never, like, seen each other or ran into Bro, each other? Bro, we probably did and didn't even know. Like, wow, even like that. even our boy David, like, the first time me and David ever had, a, ever had a conversation, he looked at me, he's like, Bro, I hated you in high school. And I was, <laughs> and, and I'm there like, bro, I didn't even know you in high school. And he goes, he told me, he's like, nah, but you were arrogant as fuck. And I'm like, yeah, you probably right. And he was like, yeah, bro, you would come for football practice with your shirt off. And you just talking to all the girls. I'm like, yeah, that sound like me. <laughs> so I couldn't be mad at bro. I'm like, all right, you had a valid point. Yeah, it's like our, our boy Emmy that's in our group too. Um, we had a class together and I didn't even know him. In, in high school like that. And he said he was always afraid to come up to me because I was wearing metal shirts. I had all these spike chains on and everything. <laughs> My hair was down. He's like, dude, I thought you were the devil. Like, I didn't, you were intimidated. I didn't want to say hi to you or anything. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it's really like that, though, because, like, me and Emmy, I met Emmy in weight training mm -hmm. our sophomore year. Like I said, I didn't know Nick until later on. Mm -hmm. So, like, all of us were in the same in the same school, and all of us somehow were intertwined with each other. But we didn't really get tight until like after high school, wow. like all, like as a group. Like David and, and do that were were tight as fuck, and Nixon was with them. Like they had y'all had a band in, in high school. Yeah, we had a high school yeah. band called Sane. Oh. Yeah, so whenever I, someone we went to a show, people would be like, "What band are you in?" We're like, "Oh, we're insane." <laughs> a little double <laughs> entendre thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that was actually my favorite metal band. Oh man, I played bass in that band. We had the best music. Our songs were six minutes long. We had different. Um, Time signatures throughout the songs, kind of like this metal band called Opeth. I don't know if you've heard of them. Okay. Yeah, they change up their time signatures. They have like six to twelve minute songs, and yeah, that's what we were doing. Yeah, you can't do that in rap nowadays. It would be one three minutes, man. Nah, nah, if it's more than two verses, people stop paying attention. Yeah. yeah. Let me see. So, have you guys faced any adversity in the music industry thus far? that you want to speak on? Uh, it's, me, not as much. Like, I, I look. 
like I rap off top. So, but I don't, the thing with me is I don't make the music that people expect me to make. Like, and I, I love when people are honest with me and be like, oh, like, that's not what I, what I thought I was going to get from you. Because oh, yeah. people that know me from my past life, they expect trap shit off top. Okay. Like, oh, you're going to talk that drug talk. And I do it, and I do it well when I do it. But yeah. I try not to do that because, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to send kids down the wrong path. Bro, my favorite, my favorite fucking, like, music in high school was Jeezy. Jeezy. Yeah. <laughs> Trap or Die came Jeezy. out, and I was on that path. You feel me? So, like, I try not to make that type of music. When I dwell on it, I, I touch on it and I do it well, but like I try to teach like more upbringing of like proper shit. And we all know I could do the gangbang music easily, yeah. but I really try to keep into a different lane and like educate people when I, when I do music. Okay. Yeah. Same. I mean, for me, when I first started doing hip hop, like I came from a metal background. So everyone thought it was just a fucking joke when I started rapping. No one took it serious. Half the people I'd send my songs to wouldn't even listen to it. You know, all my friends that I grew up with that knew I did metal and supported the metal, I'd send my hip hop songs to, and they would just brush it off. Mm. Yeah. So it was, and a lot of people just they don't. As soon as I come into the clubs, whenever I went to the clubs with a crack over here, yeah, they would be like, "Oh, you're producer, right?" Off top, bro. Every time. I oh, always thought I was producer. And, and then, like, we're performing, he'll rap, and I'm like, oh, shit, you hard. Yeah, every time. Wow. Every I time. like that shit, though, like, because it shows you, bro, don't judge a book by its cover, because mm -hmm. you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Like, you can't be out here, oh, just because man's got long hair and looks like a metal, looks like a metal <laughs> artist, doesn't mean he can't rap, too. Hey. And, like, I feel like nowadays, it's, you would expect people to be more understand, like, like, the internet has made us so, like, so privileged that you never know what a person gonna look like or sound like. Like I remember my my, uh, my boys just showed me a, a video that they had post Malone doing folk music before before White Iverson, and I was like, bro, look totally different. He clean cut. Like you can't you can't expect anything from anyone. Wow. Like anyone's capable of doing what they choose to do. Yeah, straight up, straight up. Okay. And um, I don't know if you uh, want to speak on like. The adversity you guys face, like starting music. We got the, I know you guys said something about the girls, how they broke the bands up, shit like that. <laughs> you can talk about that one. Oh man, I don't even want to talk about all that. <laughs> well, this yeah, twenty yeah, twenty twelve was or it was twenty no twenty twelve. That was the band years, the band year, and it was it was wild between the house parties and and the and the groupies, mm. like. Every time a girl would come and hang out with with a band, someone in the band fucking slept with her. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes a couple of us slept with her. Yeah. Like, it was crazy. And it was just catching feelings, like dudes catching feelings with girls that exactly. they shouldn't. Exactly. And just a bunch of mess, bro. Like, mm. yeah, the guitarist had a girlfriend, and he started missing practice because he was infatuated with her. And he kept on, oh, I'm hanging out with her today. I'm hanging out with her today. It's like, dude, we're supposed to practice. We have a show next week. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? But it was the same in hip hop too. We had enough run-ins with. Oh, that's right, because it's same country. <laughs> yeah, we had enough run-ins with with uh, dudes having fallouts over girls, oh, and yeah. then realizing later on, like, like, bro, you been my brother. Why am I getting into argument with you over a girl? That's right. Like, yeah, dude, that and I got in an argument over a girl one time. They did. And that shit it got so stupid. It got heated. It got it heated. Brought, Damn. It's. And then crack was just like, y'all need to shut the fuck up. Just stop it. Just stop it right now, because. No, on God, like I'm, I'm the person that I understand how women operate more than than most men, and I realize, like, bro, like y'all are not, probably not gonna see this girl in a year, Damn and that's what, that's usually what happens too, and that's what happened in that situation. A year later, that girl was out the picture, and it's like, oh, see, y'all was gonna. Like a year later, they were all out of the picture. Damn, they're all of them, yeah, and they was about to break everything up over them being infatuated with these women. Yeah. 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 It got it got ridiculous. We had to just take a step back and be like, nah, this is we gotta stop this shit. I had to have different homies at the house on different nights. Like that shit's not cool. Man. Oh man. <laughs> Some high school shit. <laughs> yeah, that's good that you guys like overcame that though and not for sure. Learned that lesson. And I know it was probably tough during the times you were going through it. I feel like it was tougher on like me and shit, cause like Yeah, he was a neutral party. Process. He had no involvement with yeah, any of the I'm, female. 
he just had to deal with his little homies being little crybabies about the situation. And he just had to sit us all down and be like, yo, like, just cut it out. Plain and simple. Just it focus just, on the music. Like, wow. and, and I realized, like, with our situation, at least it was just women. Because think about it. We could have been like Wu-Tang where y'all were shooting at each other. <laughs> yeah, it could have been worse. It, could, it definitely could have been worse. <laughs> wow. But they, we, everybody got it together. We're good now. Yeah. And it wasn't even the girls either because we had the, a hip-hop group called Same Country. Yeah. And we were just, in the beginning, it was fine. But then as we were all growing, little by little as artists, we were going in different directions musically. So when we would do a song, two of us would like it and the other one wouldn't. Or one would like it and the other one wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And it, would, it, always, it just became an issue with every song, after wow. song, after song, after song. So then eventually, I think I was the first one to step out of the band or the group. I stepped back. I was like, yo, I'm just going to do the solo shit because I'm tired of the band thing. Like, I thought it was just metal bands. And now it happens with hip-hop groups, mm-hmm. punk bands, any bands, country then bands. Then it's me over there just like, I just want to rap. <laughs> Everybody else got problems. I just want to rap, bro. Wow. It's life, though. You know, just encounters different things that could change different perspectives, outcomes. No, for sure. Stuff like that. And we had issues with substance abuse and stuff like oh that, my too. Oh, God, yeah. So, like, it's it's a lot that can that can occur that can wow. throw you off of your rocker if you don't, like, stick through and just make shit happen. Wow. Have you guys lost any, like, people to substance abuse? Luckily, no. Okay. We were cl- pretty close. We walked the line a few times mm-hmm. with it these was, people. Yeah. Was, and the thing is, like, crazy crazy enough is I'm the only one that was really, like, a drug dealer. And I was the one that was like, nah, bro, you got to get your shit together. Wow. Like, I'm, I was the main advocate, like, bro, we're not doing this. I remember, you remember the first contracts where I was like, y'all not sipping no lean, y'all not doing no pills. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was, this is like when I was trying to sign the metal band. I was like, listen, I'm not going for none of that shit. Because I've lost friends to, like, to both sides of, of substance abuse. Oh, okay. Dealers and users. So I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm not having that shit around me. Yeah. Like, you can smoke all the weed you want, I don't care. You could drink your liquor, do okay. what you want, but as far as you being on like, like some like, and something that can have you addicted, yeah. and can kill you, bro, I wasn't going for that. Yeah, and it wasn't just one; it was a couple of us in the group, yeah. and we've seen them both. We've seen them both when they were on it, and it's just that that almost broke up the group too. Wow. Yeah. So there was like a significant change in the character. No, significant definitely. as hell. Definitely. To the point where um, one of them would come over to hang out, and they would be on it, and then I would I would kick him out of my house. I was like, dude, like I don't like you like this. Get the fuck out. Come back when you're sober. And that's what I did. It was like once or twice I kicked him out of my house. I told him to leave. Wow. Yeah, completely you different show person. Self love. Like, if you see somebody ruin their life, it's and you really love them, you got to show them, like, nah, bro, like, I'm not going for this. I'm not going to have you around me if this is what you're going to be on because you're fucking yourself up, and I can't watch you fuck yourself up like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's a different type of hurt. That's a hurt. Like, you see your, your homie like that? That shit sucks. And I, was, I told him, I was like, come back when you're sober and off this shit, and I'll let you in. You come back on this stuff, I'm not letting you in. Wow. that you guys touched on that. Yeah, but we got we got over all of it and we're all still hanging out today. Yeah, everybody's clean. No bullshit. Everybody's doing better in life than they were in that moment. And I feel like sometimes people just do shit cuz they're bored. Yeah, definitely. That's how I started smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd be bored and it's like, oh, it's available. Right. You could be clean as a whistle, not really yeah. Nothing, you're just like, See, weed. I, I can't say nothing on weed because I've been. I started early. Yeah. Like, I started very early, and yeah, me too. I, I appreciate my parents because once I was 18, they was like, "Look, we know you smoke, bro. Just do it at the house." Oh, okay. And they would tell my friends like, "We don't care if y'all smoke. Just be here where you're in a controlled area, 
Yeah. And if anything's wrong, you can go to sleep. You're good. Like like I said, everybody used to be in my crib. Yeah, yeah. Whenever uh, we wanted to smoke, like, hey, let's just go to Cracks. We're safe there. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't nothing going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> no one got you. You know you're safe. You don't got to worry about getting arrested. I remember one of my boys got arrested one time oh. for smoking uh, by a gas station. They gave him 30 days for, for smoking. And he got out. My mom slapped the shit out of him. So how the fuck were you smoking at a gas station? Because especially him, that's like that's like one of my closest friends from high school. Yeah. Like we still talk to this day. And his mom, my mom had an understanding. Okay. Like if he's at my house, he could smoke. There was no issues. Yeah. Just because he's probably going to spend the night anyway. Like he used to be at the house doing graphics and stuff. Yeah. He'd be at the crib for like the whole weekend. He'll bike over to the crib. He'll sleep on the couch. Uh, do graphics while well, I'll leave for work. I'll leave, go to work, come back. Bro was there working on something. Yeah. And it was just like, it was really just like a creative area. Like, come over, be creative. If you want to go smoke, go smoke. You want to drink, drink. You need something to eat, go eat. Do what you got to do. Just stay here and be creative. It was really like what it was. So, I don't know, bro. Like, I can't, I can't be around people that aren't in their right state of mind when it comes to certain things. Because I know what it can do to you, and I don't want to see anyone lose their life. I've seen too many fucking hip hop artists lose their life to drugs, and it's just because they don't have anyone around them that's willing to tell them like, "Nah, bro, you gotta chill." And we need that. Like, you need you you need yes men for sure, but you need people that are like, "Nah, not happening." Like, cut that shit out. We've seen so many great people die for shit that they shouldn't have. Yeah. Like, Juice Mac Miller. It's yeah, Mac, bro, I cried when Mac died. Yeah, like big tears. Me and my me and my favorite ex girlfriend. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, right? <laughs> that sounds so crazy. But me and my favorite ex girlfriend. Shout out to her. Um, we would go to college, listen to Mac Miller, like listen to Spitter, Wiz, Mac, like real like blog era shit. Oh my That's God. all we would listen to. So like he died, and me and her really weren't even like like really Sorry. super speaking at that time. Yeah. But she called me that night. She's like, yo, did you hear Mac that? I'm like, yeah, bro. And bro, we're on the phone crying, talking to each other. Like, there's certain artists that just touch you in a certain way and like losing them to, to something that you know they shouldn't have died from. It fucks with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. You know, I got a couple friends who like died from prescription pills like Zans and shit, and um, what's the other one, fentanyl. Oh man, it's crazy out here. Yeah, for real. Yeah. I, um, I realized my situation with not fucking with pills after high school, I, I almost got a felony, well, I got hit with a felony when I was 17. Mm. Two weeks after turning 17, four pills. Mm. And um, luckily, the first offender, I was able to, to beat that shit and, and get right. But I realized in that moment that I could have fucked up my whole life off of that. And I, I feel like that's part of why I, um, I changed the way that I did as far as like, I don't want you around me if you want pills. I don't want you around me if you want lean. And I used to sip lean, bro. Like, yeah. I know the effects of that shit. Yeah. So, like, I'm like, nah, bro. Like, you can't do this shit around me because yeah. I understand what it can do to you. Yeah, I used to be sipping lean heavy and I was like 16 like half the day would go by yeah like two you, days bro, you're, by, like, you're fucking wasting time bro Xanax you don't remember what you did the next day type shit. like that's not cool yeah, and that shit makes you, you like a zombie too well that plus you gotta remember most of these people are under 21 doing this shit your frontal lobe isn't developed and you're fucking you're eating away at it already by you doing these drugs that you're not supposed to be doing that wasn't made for you to do recreationally so like I don't know, dog. That's <laughs> I ain't even to get deep like that, but for real, that shit bothers me. No, nah, that's that's what yeah. If I was on A block, I gotta ask everything. Nah, you know? I feel that, bro. <laughs> shit, ask away. Yeah, but um, just let's just go back to the label. So, uh, can you speak a little bit about EDMG? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so before ECMG, I had um, I had started my first business at twenty. It's called Cobain's World Enterprises. And um, I was working with, with a friend of mine from high school. We're back cool now. We weren't speaking for like years. And he, um, he had a group called Track Trappers, Track Trappers Music Group. So we were trying to basically make everything um, incorporated underneath that. 
oh, and, wow. and run it properly. This is blog era time, so it's like 2010, 2011. And um, I started building a little buzz in the city. I uh, performed a few places out here doing, doing well. But um, he brought this other guy into the mix, and uh, I feel like dude was just like sloppy in the way that he did music. Like he, uh, mm. he would show up to the studio and not have his money to pay to, to record. He would show up without having the lyrics for songs. And I'm like, all right, bro, like, you're not taking this as seriously as the rest of us. And it bothers me because I take what I do seriously. So if, if I'm showing up and I'm having to cover you fucking up, that's a problem to me. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started ECMG, it was just making sure that I was with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And even with ECMG, we've had, like, shit that wasn't, always great like I said there was issues with girls there's issues with substance abuse this is just I feel like this is shit that just happens in music bro there's always gonna be uh there's always gonna be hurdles to get over and now I feel like we're at a point where we got through all those hurdles and I don't have to feel like I'm a babysitter at all like oh. I can hit Nixon hey bro what you got working on he's gonna be, oh I did this this and this today uh I had this is my schedule for the year like I love that shit like I shouldn't have to ask you like oh when do you want to drop something you should be like, hey, bro, this is what I'm working on. This is my game plan. Uh, I just need you to help me with this, this, and that. So I know, okay, cool. Like, I got to help you with the marketing for it. No problem. Um, mm. Do you have a graphic designer in mind? Do you have a videographer in mind? Um, what producers are you working with? Shit like that. As far as before, where it was like, oh, like, I felt like I was really, yo, did you write to this song? Yo, are you ready to go record? Yo, you got to come over. We got to practice to perform. Yo, this, yo, that. Like, before it was more, I felt like I had to be, like, in general mode. And now I don't have to be, like, everyone's adults now. And I'm, like, my goal for next year is to start working with younger artists and, like, build them up. And I know I'm going to have to get back in, like, that general mode. <laughs> and it's cool. Like, it's cool at this point because now, like, I'm a father now. So I'm already, <laughs> I'm already used to dealing with, like, baby and shit. Yeah. And I think, like, everything that I did with music made me being a dad easier because yeah. no legit like bro, like if you could deal with artists you could deal with kids wow if you can deal with artists you can deal with kids because artists are the most difficult motherfuckers <laughs> on earth <bro. laughs> trust me I know because I engineer also so you already know bro yeah you know how uh, artists would come to the studio and not have lyrics written yeah or try to pay half the cost yeah just bro, different stuff like that that shit is wild to me Half the cost, like you should be showing up with the full fucking cost. <laughs> what? A, that's, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. People always gonna try to cut corners, and that's that's always been my biggest thing with music is I don't ask for discounts. Mm. I don't ask for like any anything is that I feel like I would feel insulted if you came at me with. I don't do. That's what's up. Especially if you're a friend, like I'm not gonna come to a friend be like, oh, you my dog, like, let me get it for half price. Nah, bro. What's your price? I'm gonna pay your price. And all of my friends. I have this problem with all of my friends. All of my friends always try to give me discounts. I have one homie that's a photographer. He did like one of my first photo shoots. And I was like, bro, how much do I owe you? He's like, name your price. Like, bro, this is not progressive. I'm not naming my <laughs> price. <laughs> how much do I owe you? <laughs> now, I have the same argument with my graphic designer. Because she'll be like, oh, I told you I was going to get it to you last week. And I never did. But it's here now. So you can just give me, just give me half of it. I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah, I'm going to give you the full amount. Because... That's, it is what it is. I'm not yeah, going to half-ass the price on you. Exactly. Yeah, everybody has to eat. Exactly. Everybody has to eat. But yeah, bro, like, I'm, like I said, I'm really, I'm really happy with where I am with all the artists on the label right now. Like Everybody has been constantly working. Like Emmy has English and Spanish projects getting ready to drop. Wow. Nixon has a project getting ready to drop. As, along with that, we're, uh, we're working on an EP together right now. Um, me and Spaz are working on the EP. Spaz is working on his project. Like everybody's working. I'm working. My project's done. Like my project's done on re recording side. I'm just getting all the visuals and stuff together right now. So like everybody has like constant music that they're about to start dropping like crazy. So like I'm in a happy space with it. That's what's up. Yeah. And like, um, this is a question more so for me. Like, how did you meet um, Russ and Slim? Or wavy and uh, uh, slim. well, you know me and Slim met on some gang banging stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, <laughs> that's that's a little hobby. <laughs> but um, just just good people, bro. Yeah, for real. Good people always gonna connect. Like if somebody's good, you gonna connect with them. 
Yeah. Me and Slim met on on some on some neighborhood stuff, and yeah. we just he's he's a young nigga with some good energy. And yeah, I love that around me, bro. Like if you if you young and you got good energy, you could be around me all day, bro. Like that's, what's up. that's yeah. what it was. And that's how me and you met, cause of Slim, and he was a young nigga with some good energy. I'm like, okay, I fuck with bro, and we 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 have a lot of the same like things that we that we're into. Like we feel like you have to have a good credit and things of that sort. We feel like you have to give back to your community and yeah. build people up. And just you being on, on that type of mind frame, I'm like, oh, yeah, I rock with bro. Appreciate it. Yeah. That. Yeah, a little bit more into the credit. Yeah, I also do uh, credit repair, credit consult. Um, I help people across all 50 states mm -hmm. uh, assess their credit report, see if any uh, other companies are in, under federal violation on the FCRA, or I can help you get funding or raise your credit score. So that's a little bit about, I mean, what I do uh, now more so that the music started. The music was like a foundation for me at first, and then it branched out to engineering. I also have a soul food business, Soul Flow Good. Uh, I have uh, Ace Credits, that, mm -hmm. that as well. I know there's another one I'm missing because there's so much. <laughs> but that's the thing. You, you say so you, you, you not only diversified your portfolio in, like, on the business side, but you also did it with the credit side. So you really can help a person in a way that most people can't. The biggest issue I've seen with a lot of artists is they know nothing about credit. They know nothing about contracts. What I did before I ever started the business was I learned about, I learned about business. I learned yes. about building credit. And the crazy part is I always say, bro, I learned more outside of school than in school <laughs> as far as owning businesses go. Like if I was 18 again, I wouldn't go to college right away. Mm -hmm. because I learned more from business owners than I did in college classes. College classes taught me the lingo and how to, um, how to like structure things. But the business owners taught me how to get that done in Brad street, how to build that business credit, how to that pay that score. Exactly, bro. How to make things happen for real. How to raise that. Uh, Cause you got three different scores, uh, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, you got it on the uh, business side, mm -hmm. Dunn and Brad, the Lexus, Lexus and all that stuff yep. on the underhand that people don't know about. <laughs> but like I said, I learned more outside of school than in school. Um, and that's that's not me shitting on school because I think that school is a good structure yeah. that can help you. But if you have, I feel like we need to go back to uh, to people having mentors and, oh. and actual like internships. Because I feel like there's a lot the kids can learn. Like you could definitely help somebody younger than you set up their business to be in the point where they can, uh, let's say they set up their business knowing, knowing what you know, mm -hmm. and they go get that, uh, that credit, that business credit, and they start using that business credit to actually shoot their music videos, set up their studio, do things of that sort. They could avoid some of the, some of the woes that me and Nixon and artists like us went through being young, just spending money out of our pocket and not knowing any better. Yeah, that's that's true. Those were the days, huh? <laughs> bro, they don't they don't know scraping up to to take trips to Atlanta, and <laughs> bro, for real. and shit like that, bro. Like, but but uh, like I said, us not knowing better. Had we known what we knew now, we'd have been putting that shit on credit cards. Yo, for real. Instead of coming out of pocket, you feel me? But man, y'all live and learn. All y'all quit y'all job just to go to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to quit. That's the funniest part. So Ooh, we all man. we all got uh, jobs together, and um, Nixon was the first one to leave, and then uh, my boy do that was went to the to the head of the building, and was like, "I'm going on tour," and she goes, "Oh, that's awesome!" And he quit. I'm in the business, killing it. I'm making commission every week. Oh well, <laughs> I'm getting I'm putting my hours in. I go to the lady the week before we're supposed to go. And I was like, yeah, Friday's going to be my last day. No, I said, Wednesday's going to be my last day. Um, I'm going out of state. And uh, if I want to come back, I'll apply when I come back. She said, oh, no, baby, you don't have to quit. Go on tour. <laughs> she, she said, go, go do what you have to do. And when you come back, just come see me. I'm like, all right, no problem. We go to Atlanta for A3C, have a ball. A fucking ball. A ball, bro. Craziest. Probably one of the craziest trips I've ever been on. I've been all over. Um, met everybody from from Jaron Benton to Schoolboy Q. 
this is when Schoolboy Q had gone like fat for sipping lean. Yeah. And we just out there cracking jokes on him. He cracking back. Uh, we met Trader Truth, uh, Talib Kweli, oh, like hella people. Mafia Six. That's right. We met the whole Three Six Mafia, except for Juicy J. Um, Caught him in the lobby of a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Like it was so. It was funny as fuck because we uh, we had just came from Zaxby's and I had like a kid sized cup, and I was joking around. I, I got leaned in my kitty cup, in my kitty cup, just joking. Yeah. And um, Lord Infamous, rest in peace. Yeah. Walks up to us, goes, "What you said, man?" And I repeat it. And he's like, "Man, you cool as fuck." And he like exchanges information with us. He dies like a couple months later. May he rest in peace. But um, it was him and him and DJ Paul. DJ Paul. Um, bro, I, I wish like, I wish A3C was still the way it used to be, cause like we learned a lot that weekend. A bro, lot. We, bro, we're we're there going to like all the different shows, having a fucking ball. But yeah. then we're also going to um. Well, you remember the name of that hotel? I don't remember the name of anything M. up there. Start with an M. I don't remember what it was called. But uh, it was a hotel where they would have, like, symposiums. Oh, wow. And you would go into, um, you would go into whichever symposium you wanted based on the, the time slot that it was. Yeah. So, like, they had symposiums on, on touring. Um, all the shit that I'm saying that, that you would, like, do fire with, like, how to, how to, use, uh, how to use your credit to, to fund things, yeah. um, how to get, like, bookings. Just anything that you would need to know in music, you could have learned in that hotel that weekend. You just have to be willing to get your ass up at the crack of dawn. Yep. Go to sleep like two in the morning. And that's what we did. And we got up early. <laughs> yeah, as fuck. we were early. Early. And we were out all day. We were out for what, like 16 hours? Something Easily. like that. Easily. We'd bro. leave around 8 a.m., get back to the hotel at like 2 like 30 two, yeah. in the morning. Uh, but it was then for it. certain reasons, we'd have to go to the gym and kill some energy for yes, sir. a couple of hours to about 4 a.m., 4 30. We talk about that, but. We yeah, won't we, touch on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, who did that? <laughs> but, yeah, we, we did a lot. We did a lot in that time frame. And, um, bro, it was just, it was, it was good for hip-hop. And we don't have those type of things anymore. Like, South by Southwest is even the same anymore. And that was great back in the days as far as going out there, networking with people, spreading your music, meeting other artists. Bro, we um so many independent artists just out there performing their music. They would just pull up on the by the sidewalk, open up the trunk, big old speaker, and just start start doing their music right there. We really connected with a lot of a lot of artists that became huge. Um, meeting in these small places, uh, made in Tokyo. We knew made in Tokyo before he ever made uh, Uber everywhere. Yeah, him and um him and Twenty Four Hours, okay. formerly known as Rose Royce Rizzy, they used to be down here all the time. Uh, we used to, the first time we met them was in Coconut Grove at a, um, at an open mic. Was Shout it, out to the Nick goose. Six. The goose, at right? The goose. The goose. Yeah, at an open mic, they came through. Yeah. Uh, he Back performed. when he was still Royce Rizzy. Mm -hmm. This is before Goddamn Drop, if you remember. This, I thought he performed Goddamn. Nah, this is before it dropped. Oh, that was before. Yeah, damn. this was like a month or two before that drop. Um, we met uh, Curtis Williams from 2-9. Uh, from Mm, yeah. Like right before two nine really blew up, they were just starting to buzz, and um, bro, so many people. Mm. Uh, Dash's Clay too, right? Shout out to Dash's Clay, Yo, yeah. Dash's Clay still killing stuff in Miami. We met Dash's Clay back then. Was a cool like there was a, there was a lot of people that were coming to Miami in that time frame. Bro, we saw a fucking um, I met Forty Ounce Van at Art Basel. In like 2013. Been this is like when the hats first started the buzz. Wow. Yeah, I met him. Um, 2013, Art Basel was me and Duda on the beach uh, at this freaking. It was like this. It was like a pool hall slash restaurant. So like one half was a restaurant, the other half was like a lounge. Mm. And he was in there just chilling. Shout out to Ashley Outrageous. That's how I got that invite. She um, she used to do like this uh this list every year for freaking for Art Basel, of like yeah. all the dope hip hop events. And um, she like had gotten to this event and was like, oh yeah, I'm here. And I just pulled up, <laughs> like it was that simple. I just pulled up and 40 ounce van was in there chilling. Wow. So like you, you could really meet some good people back then. Like the, I, I always said in this very powerful bro, if you use it correctly, it can take you places. And it can, it can have you meet some very fucking dope people. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. 
I feel like I got a different experience as well because I was signed at 17. So they would take me to like showcases, symposiums mm -hmm. and things like that, panels. Yeah. And I'm learning from um, people that produce for the Migos, people that produce for Jeezy, people that produce for Wayne. Mm -hmm. They're just up there talking like, oh, don't talk over the, the vocal, uh, have your track ready, um, engage, with the <clears throat> engage with the audience. You know, it's funny you saying that. We had that conversation earlier because, <laughs> like, I can't perform with the music playing. It always fucks me up. Yeah. And um, he, he was like, bro, I don't have just the, just the beat alone right now. And I was like, damn. And he was like, oh, I'm going to hit our engineer. I'm like, bro, it's Mother's Day. We probably not going to get him. And I was like, we might have to karaoke this shit. And he was like, bro, I hate karaoke. That's what we call <laughs> it. When you, like, when you perform over your, over your vocals, we call it karaoke. Because... So the way that we started performing, like we used to go in my backyard and practice, hmm. and we never had the vocals. We'll just have like the um, we'll the have just the beat and our ad libs, and then of course the chorus, so we could take a breath. And we would like, we didn't have a, a actual stage, but we had like that little metal, that little uh, wooden thing in my backyard, at at the crib by the um, by the canal. Oh, the little garden thing. The little garden type. Yeah, yeah it was like a little garden type thing. We would practice underneath that. Like it was the size of a stage then there, so we could walk around, um, get get our shit off in that in that area, mm -hmm. and make sure like all right when we go perform, everybody knows how to move. Think of you. I know you've probably seen Five Heartbeats and Temptations. Yeah. You remember how they would practice? I don't remember how to practice. Where um, where they have the the one guy that would be in the front, and the other guys on the side doing a little snap shit, and then the one guy would slide to the front. And oh, shit like okay, that. Yeah, like yeah, we would yeah. have, we, bit, yeah, right. we weren't doing that. We weren't doing oh. our boy band shit, but we would have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we would practice like, all right. So we're gonna like, so we always practiced in case it was only one mic or two mics. So we would have, we'd practice like, okay, if it's one mic, we're gonna rotate this way. Okay. If it's two mics, we'll rotate this way and shit like that. And I feel like that's important, bro. Like, stage presence matters. Um. I feel like stage presence matters. Connecting with people matters. Like, yeah. the one thing we always did after we finished performing was we would go into the crowd and we would talk to everybody. Wow. And I feel like that's important. I've been to different shows where I see people perform and they just, like, duck off. And I'm like, bro, you're like, how are you going to grow your fan base if you're not talking to people? Yeah. And that's why I said, like, like what Nixon was saying. Like, people would be like, oh, you love the producer. And then he gets off stage and like, damn, bro, you hard. Like, it's because yeah. he actually goes back in the crowd and he's talking to people and he gets to connect with them. Mm -hmm. There was one performance I didn't, but that's because they were trying to shoot me off halfway through my performance. They were just trying to, like, cut me off. Remember that? It was. Um, oh, yeah, that, that one show. I forgot his name. With uh, the Palmetto with us. With the homie um, Alex? No, Is I think it, it was, like, Cole or something. Oh, yeah, that was. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, right. He tried, he kept no, trying the to homie who put the show together was Alex. Oh, I don't know. Alex don't Black know. or something like that. I don't remember. Andrew. 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 My bad, Andrew. Shout Andrew. out to you. <laughs> Yo, for real, shout out. But yeah, no, like, I don't know. It's like, I, when I got off the stage after all of that, I was just, I was just annoyed with everything going on there. I was like, you know what, let's just get the fuck out. That was the one time I didn't stick around and engage with, interact with the, with the audience. You know what? That was a sad night, bro. Now that I think about it, we, um, there was another, I don't know if you remember, we had a homie there from high school named Andrew, who, um, like a year later, died in a boating accident. Garcia. Garcia. Oh, that's yeah. right. He was, he was there that, that night? He was there that night. Yeah. Oh, shit. That was the last time I saw him. That was the last was, time I saw him, too. I mean, yeah. I don't remember him being mm -hmm. there, but. Yeah, it was him and, him and, uh, same homie you saw my Colston. They Colston, were all together. yes, yeah, Colston. They were all together that night. Wow. So you saying that just made me bring that up, just made me think about that. Yeah. Because he had on the, uh, the, the Pittsburgh jersey. He was a Steelers fan for like, since like high school, and I just thought about That's that shit. Right, now he that was. You, now yeah. that you said that, I just thought about that. Man, let's not talk about that. Though. No, <laughs> just for, real. That. No, real. for real. <laughs> but that just came in. That just well, came bad to memories. Said it. Huh? Bad memories. No, like, homie was cool. No, I just remembered, like, the last time I saw him was at Nixon show. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, um... He had came, there was somebody that was, like, heckling. Yeah. But dude was cool. He was just drunk that night. He was yeah. Like, That's all it was. Oh, okay. He was just on some drunk stuff. And, yeah. And then um, the homie that passed away was there with him that night. 
and they ended up passing away in like a road bad like boating accident. They were out boating one night and they hit something. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was a, was it boating or jet ski? No, they were boating. They were boating. They, they, were, they were on the boat, and um the girls the girl um ended up surviving, oh, but the two right. guys that was on the boat ended up passing. That sounds yeah. familiar. This is like thirteen or fourteen, either two thousand thirteen or fourteen. Yeah, it was it was a real bad. Yeah, sounds like I heard that story yeah. before. Wow. So what they were trying to like uh like cut your music on stage? Yeah, they were drunk and they were just they wanted to go on and just uh what was it, improvise. They were just yeah. they just wanted to play, just play around and all that. They were drunk and it was an open mic night. That's what that's all it was. But I was taking it serious, like a performance. So I had uh a few songs in order. I had USB. I had the ad libs, the choruses, and I was doing a performance. And about song three or four, they were just trying to like yeah, dude, nudge trying me to like off, jump on the stage and like grab the mic so he could perform. It's like, bro, like this is this is not professional. We understand it's open mic, but we're taking this professionally. And the uh, the dude that's putting together is a good guy. Shout out to him. He um we knew him from school too. And he was the one that like invited bro out there. He was like, he was pissed off by it because he was like, bro, like this, this is something I'm making money off of doing. And you guys are coming here fucking it up by you jumping on stage while other people are doing what they're doing. So he was kind of like irritated by it. Yeah, but I, I do appreciate the, the opportunity. So again, shout out to Andrew Black. Yeah, that's what's up. Man, it sounds like you guys been through the ringer. No, I mean, man. not like it's, it's crazy, been fun, crazy. Bro. Not even through the ringer. It's been it's been fun. You <laughs> <laughs> you you learn from you learn from your mistakes and other people's mistakes. Yeah, that's and true. And I can say that like I've, bro, I've been through enough stuff musically that I have memories for the rest of my life. Like wow, that's good and bad. Like, but it's way more good than bad. That's good. Yeah, the bad it's shit is the bad shit is shit that just it was just like. Shit happens, you feel me? Yeah, yeah it's, it's out of your yeah. control. It it's is what even, it is. It's not even like, damn, like I want to beat a nigga's ass over. It's just like, oh, this happened. Oh, okay. Yeah, like we've been in, we've been in shows where like I had to. I remember that that one show we went to where Buddy was like performing, and I had to like nudge his ass. Cause oh was, yeah, like, over we at were, the one. Yeah, we were um we had take one one time. Okay. And dude was performing. He was like on the bar, and like I'm like standing by the bar, and dude was like, <sighs> damn, they're like stepping. Like oh yeah yeah, yeah. I'm like yo like, what the fuck you doing yeah and um me and him <laughs> that's that's where our anger me and Nixon that's where our anger comes in comes in well because like we were both like bro if they jump off this shit we're knocking the ass out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I was telling crack I was like if he starts swinging at you I'm jumping in there with you bro I got you but yeah. it was like it wasn't even like me on some like I wasn't even on some match I'm just like bro like be respectful to everybody around you. Yeah. yeah, for real. We're just trying to listen like, to the music. I understand that you're like you're raging to your music. More power to you, bro. I respect that, mm. but be respectful, bro. And All I right. feel like that's that's something that we've seen we've seen that happen enough times. I remember going to uh to the ASAP Mob show where they got into a Raider clan because niggas were throwing water bottles at the stage and shit like that. And it's like with them it was something deeper, of course, but just if someone's performing, bro, be respectful. Cardi had the situation where the person Recently, uh, threw something to her and she hit them with the mic. Oh yeah, and I was yeah, I was like, bro, I understand that shit. Like, if you're if you're doing your job, and somebody's fucking with you, bro, it's gonna annoy the shit out of you. Yeah. So yeah, I, I just feel like people should be respectful when they go to see artists do art. And for some reason, people will pay to see an artist perform and then do dumb shit. But that's neither here nor there. Like, I don't know, bro. Like, people just got to do better. That's true. I mean, so um, any TV shows, movies that you guys grew up watching that really inspired you on a creatively or musically or just like um like shaped your character? I thought my character was shaped just based on the the amount of places I lived. Really. Oh, okay. Um. I definitely do use a lot of references from movies and TV shows and shit in my music. Everything from like hood movies to Disney, like, <laughs> like on oh God. <laughs> um, when I was twenty, I did a freestyle and I started that shit. I said, "I'm a menace to society, but you call me cocaine." My old dogs in my pants are a wax and yo dame. Asalam alaikum. That's where the Sharif. My Jordan's down like the project that rep Grape Street. 
and I was talking about the characters from Menace to Society. So, like, yeah, I definitely do get inspiration from just watching shit. Oh. So I might, I might be, like, you probably remember this. We did a song called Spur of the Moment. And the reason that song got written was because we was watching The Heat versus Spurs. <laughs> oh, that's right. We that's that right. Night. Yeah, yeah. So, like, bro, inspiration can come from anything. And I'm, I'm really that type of artist where um, if I'm watching basketball, I might. My song Jordan Pippen came from me watching the All Star game. These fools that came over the day before, we had like a, a major smoke out for my birthday. We had like four different strains of purple. <laughs> we went crazy. And then the next the next time I was at the crib by myself chilling watching uh, watching the dunk contest. And um while watching the dunk contest, I wrote that song. Damn. So like, yeah, inspiration can come from anywhere. Sort of pivot, yeah, that was hard. Yeah, anywhere. And I'm a nerd. I love video games, I love movies, I love all that shit and like he said, Jordan Pippen, just because he was watching the dunk contest. I have a song called Must Be a Weasley. I'm a Harry Potter fan. Ooh. I have a whole song, just Harry Potter. He went in on okay, that motherfucker, too. Yeah. Wow. So, like, what, what other games in specific? Or oh, man, everything. Like, even um, games like Dead Island has inspi- have inspired me to just, uh, I forgot what, I think it's, uh, I have a song called Off My Sway. And in in the second verse, I say, infected zombies in Block C, I chop at their knees, and it's because I came up with that because I had the beat playing when I was playing Dead Island, and my character was in Block C, and I was literally chopping the knees of zombies, <laughs> and like I wrote that out, and then it just went into a whole thing, and it's crazy. It's, you get inspiration from anywhere, anywhere. Wow. I had, what about you? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me see, like Crash Bandicoot. I remember uh, Crash. I used to fuck with Crash when I was younger. <laughs> on PS1. Like, yeah, yeah, OG sir, shit. yeah. <laughs> I was more into uh, Banjo-Kazooie. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I love Banjo-Kazooie. That was my sisters. They played that. My older sisters. Let me see. Attack in the Power, Juju. That might be my time. I'm trying to think about something in specific. Let me see. Boys in the Hood. Um, Danny Phantom. Okay. It's a ghost shit. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say I get my inspiration from, like, anything in specific. It's just what like, comes to you. It's like a camaraderie yeah. of everything. And What's your writing style? Uh, uh, it, it's crazy. Because I used to record on my Nintendo DS. So oh, sometimes, shit, okay. Yeah. Damn. I used to get, like, whoopings for that, too. For real? For my dad, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just probably, like, just talk hear my voice because mm-hmm. I go off like the sound of my voice because I got so many different flows right. I don't know if you hear my music I have but I got really different flows so I'm going to hear the sound of my voice first and then I'm going to be like set the tone based on my voice okay like how I'm feeling that day so it just all depends on the vibe see for me a lot of times I, I freestyle yeah. um, and then I write and the way that I actually ended up starting doing that was um, my first studio session ever was making a reference for an artist. I'm not gonna say who. <laughs> <laughs> a very big artist though. Me, you would talk outside of the interview, and I'll tell you who it was. Oh. But um, it was with Tony Galvin, and he rest in peace. He was producing for this artist, and um, it was that artist's first major single for their first uh, studio album. We had already known them for like killing shit. So um, my cousin called me. I was at I was at school my freshman year in college. And um, I used to send my cousin lyrics all the time, like, hey, like, cuz, check this out. Like, I just wrote this. Okay. And um, he was like, yo, what time are you getting out of school? I was like, I get out at 6, but I can, uh, I can leave a little early if you need me to. He was like, I need you to be down south by 6.30 and take me to, um, to go meet with a producer that has something he wants you to work on. Like, all right, cool. I left school like 4.30. Yeah. Because um, I was like, all right, like, let me go make this shit happen. I went down there. Um, Producer pulls up the beat. I'm still pissed every time I hear that song because I wasn't the artist that got chosen. But <laughs> you feel me? But <laughs> but that wasn't even like my style of music. It was like a real slow tempo beat. Oh, okay. Um and I sat there and um I was just like freestyling uh different choruses for this for this artist. 
Damn. And I was like, okay, cool. Then um, once I did like I did like six different choruses, and uh, Tony Galvin was like, okay, I really like this chorus. Now I want you to freestyle a verse. And I was like, okay, cool. So I like freestyle a verse, and he's like, all right, we're gonna keep that. I'm gonna send that in as a sample. Um, it was me, Shoney, who used to be signed to Slip and Slide, okay. and like 20 other artists that did references for this artist single. Um, I was about to sing the song just now. I was <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that it was it was a really popular song and the video was shot in Jamaica. Oh, okay. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, so my my uh my biggest style is usually if if I like a beat, I freestyle to it. And um once I freestyle to it, I'll be like, okay, I'll say like a bar to that I like and I'll write that down and then I'll go from there. Um there's certain songs that I have though where I didn't have a beat, I just wrote the song, and then later on, I found beats to match with them. Damn. Yeah. That's tough. It is, but when I was when I was in like high school, bro, I didn't have any producer friends. Oh. So you feel me? I used to just write. That's how I used to like my typing for my typing class. I never, um, I never really fucked with the way that the, the typing assignments. So to practice outside of class, I used to just type lyrics on my laptop. I'll just take the, I'll put up a like a word document yeah. and I'll just type lyrics, okay. and that's how I practice typing. Damn. So like I have different styles of writing, but I prefer to like freestyle my shit and see like how I'm, how I'm feeling on the beat before I record anything. Okay. Yeah, but that's what I was telling you earlier about um with me with the whole car videos and shit. Yeah. Like that's just me getting myself comfortable uh, with being in front of cameras because like, bro, I hated cameras, bro. Oh. Like hated. It was like a phobia, you would say. It's it. I won't say it's a phobia. It was just learned behavior. Oh, oh, cause you're learning to work. Let's see. When I was younger, yeah. Yeah, I get, I get what yeah. you're saying. Same here, same here. So like, I was like, just being on camera. I'm like, nah, my like, bro, don't take no pictures of me. <laughs> <laughs> I was that type of person. So like, I had to like break myself out of that shit. Mm. Remember when we went to, so we saw my A three C earlier. Remember when we went to A three C and we uh met homie from Atlanta and he came up to us, he said, Oh what's up man? I'm da 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 I'm da 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 and I was like, Bro, I wasn't gonna say hi back to you just on some Miami shit, but I remembered where I am and he's like, Yeah man, we're all products of our environment and that's just real, bro. Like you become a product of your environment and you gotta mm. break that mold if you wanna really do what you say you wanna do. Cause like I realized, like, being in Miami, bro, we don't say hi to people. Mm -hmm. Now we're ignorant as hell like, down here. South Florida is fucked up. We don't say hi to people, bro. Mm -hmm. You go outside of South Florida, and you realize everybody's friendly. Mm -hmm. Like, nigga, Chicago. I've been all over Chicago, and people say hi to you. Wow. And you would think Chicago would be like here. Nah. Bro, L.A., even yeah. L.A., people will say hi to you. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, niggas could be ignorant out there, but they they'll say hi to you. <laughs> New York is New York is like Miami. Yeah. You ain't getting no highs. Jersey's worse than New York and Miami. <laughs> 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 but yeah, bro. I, so I've been to forty states. Okay. Because of the the line of work I was doing for a few years, like I would do a lot of traveling, yeah. and in most in most places they say hi to you. Wow. Miami has us like programmed where we don't speak to people. Yeah. That's crazy. And we don't realize that it's learned behavior until we get outside of that, like our elements. Why do you think it's like that? It's I, honestly, I don't know. Like, we just lack southern hospitality as a southern state, and that's why, like, people always say New York. People always say Miami is the New York of of, uh, of the South, and it's true, bro. Like, there's a there's like a you know what I think it is really. I'm, I'm answering that for real. I think everyone thinks that they're bigger than they are. Yeah, I was thinking that just now. Everyone thinks that they're bigger than they are. And um I don't know, like I went to we bro, we went to school with how many celebrity children? And more than I can count on three hands. And they were all normal people. They like Oh yeah. Bro, we went to school with all of Bob Marley's grandchildren. I was just about to first say that. generation of grandchildren. And they were cool as hell. They were all cool. Cool as hell. Polite as shit. We went to school with Tim Hardaway's son, bro. Oh wow. He was cool as hell. Yeah. Like 
of course they they all have their days where they can be dickish. We all we're all human. Like we have those days. But no, like the the children of rich people don't act like dicks for the most part. Yeah, you won't even notice that yeah. they're there. Bro, we went to school with Michael Beasley's uh, sister. Um, I swear I've been around probably more celebrities and their children in Miami than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Other than when I lived in, yeah, bro, yeah, honestly, LA. in Miami, other than, other than anywhere else that I've lived. Oh, okay. But they're normal people, and I feel like normal people try to act like they're bigger than they are. And that's where the issue lies. Like, just be human, bro. If you see somebody, it's okay to say hi. You don't gotta like. You don't gotta eat that man. You don't gotta look at him tough. Like, that's how you make human connections by saying hi to people. And I don't know. Like, it's just something about this area where we all feel like we're bigger than we are. Wow. I don't know that shit. It, it's wild to me. I feel like it's not hard. I mean, I feel like it's not hard not to act like that because everybody grows up around each other, and then. You know, conversations happen. It's just yeah. like everybody just want to be a star. Think about kids, bro. Kids, yeah. <laughs> kids walk to each other on, on playgrounds, and it doesn't matter what you look like or who you are. You're gonna say hi to each other. Yeah. You're gonna yeah. say hi, and you're gonna be friendly. Like, like we gotta we gotta start implementing that as adults mm. to some extent. Like, yeah, I understand you're not gonna fuck with everybody's energy off top, but if you just I've met some of the coolest people that I know in life off of just a simple hello. I met motherfuckers that taught me about cryptocurrency off of hello. I met people that taught me things about business off of hellos. We like, met each other off of hello. Yeah. Wow. It's, you can meet a lot of cool people off of just a hello. Wow. And, bro, like, a hello and a smile are the two best things in the world. Because mm. a motherfucker can be angry as shit or look angry as shit and not be. Like, I know me, bro. I look angry as fuck all the time. <laughs> I can't help Same it. Here. I'm a I'm an angry-looking black man, and I try not to be. I try to smile as much as possible because I don't want to have people thinking, like, oh, like, you're pissed Pressure. at the world. I'm really not, bro. I just I just have a serious face at all times. Mm-hmm. But if you speak to me, I'm going to speak back. Yeah. And I don't know, bro. Like, I feel like that, that can change a lot of things in the world if we just just say hello to people. Smile more, enjoy the fact that we're fucking living. You feel I me? Mean? I I wholeheartedly agree with that. That's why I have the book out, um, Mental Health Manifest Your Desire Results. It's on mm-hmm. Amazon. You could go grab that. I just speak on like my, my pandemic journey, how I ventured through that. You know, mm-hmm. we were in isolation, and then going back outside, it was like kind of a different step that we had to take. Like learning how to walk after you broke your leg mm-hmm. and rehab. And that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, <laughs> like analogy for it. Yeah. That's uh, what I really, uh, you can speak on that. Cause yeah. you were, you were that's affected like my differently after the pandemic. Oh yeah. On how no. you deal with people. No, cause, uh, my parents, well, my dad's old, he's pulling up on 80. So, you know, they always said like the, the old folks are going to get it the worst. So I turned into, you ever seen that show Monk? The, he's a detective, but he's got OCD. Yes. Yeah, so I turned into him. So I was making everyone wash their hands when they got home. I would literally wipe down the doorknobs, refrigerators with, with, with wipes and everything because oh. that's, that's what oh. the pandemic did to me. Like, the isolation didn't bother me. It was oh. the fact that I could bring the virus into the home and kill my father with it. Wow. That's what bugged me about it. So I would wipe everything down. I would, every time I went out and came home, I would take those clothes off, wash them, and go shower down, even if I had to go back out an hour or two. Wow. Yeah. Like, I went crazy really over it. Serious about it, but I, but I understand where he was coming from, though. Like, I lost my pops, not in the pandemic. I lost him after the pandemic. He, um, he ended up having a heart attack in his sleep after uh, he went to the hospital for diabetes. Um, went to one hospital, caught COVID in the hospital Damn. after not having COVID the whole pandemic. The whole pandemic, man, never caught COVID. Yeah. Two years after, so 2022, he caught COVID in the hospital. Yeah. They released him. I had to take him to a different hospital. I took him to Baptist. He um, recovered at Baptist and everything. He um, ended up having to do, like, rehab to, uh, to get, like, his walking and stuff back. Wow. Um, which was, what was crazy was he, uh, he had a stroke during the pandemic. 
and he had like a like a small brain bleed um, from that. And I think like all of that later on ended up adding on to what he went through and stuff like that. But um, yeah, he like he survived the COVID. He uh, rehabbed and everything, and then after being back home for a few weeks, he just had a heart attack in his sleep. Wow. But like, yeah, bro, like the pandemic didn't, it didn't affect me like as, as toughly as it did Nixon. Cause Nixon, like, I understand where he was coming from. Like, nah, bro, I gotta be on point for me and my family. For me, I was, I was doing Postmates and shit. I was making money during the pandemic. Mm. Um, I was still like, I was masked up and everything. I made sure mm. to keep my house as clean as possible to avoid anyone getting it. I never got that shit until 2021 when the motherfucker um, came to work knowing they had it. Yeah, people are people are bad, bro. Like, yeah, dude knew he had and came to work and gave it to like half of the store. And I didn't feel it bad. Like, I was just like, I was more pissed I had to be at home, wow. like losing money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was more like, bro, like, I, I felt no symptoms. I was like, bro, I'm sitting at home Asymptomatic, just. I was pissed because I had a I had a show in uh in in California that I had to cancel. Wow. Yeah, that was like that was the worst part of it for me. I'm like, bro, I'm losing money and I can't perform. And I had like I had like features lined up in Cali and shit, so I lost hella money in that moment based on somebody else's carelessness. But that's life, bro. You learn from shit. I hope that person learned like don't do stuff like that. Because you're not just affecting you, you're affecting other people. But, you know. But you writing a book about that, that's actually fucking dope. And I respect that because... No, definitely. Like, we, we, like we really do need to pay more attention to mental health. I did, um, I did therapy right after the pandemic. Wow. Yeah. I, and I felt it was needed. Um, I knew I was becoming a father. And I was like, um, there were certain things that I needed to work through myself before raising anyone else. So I, I went into therapy and I, um, I had a lot going on at the time. My brother, um, in 2019 was wrongfully arrested in Northern Florida, um, for a suspended license. And he, uh, was, he was tased while having a seizure. So like that fucked with him for, for a bit. Like he was in a state of psychosis for over a year, bro. And dealing with him having the seizures after that. And then finding out that the person that I had just broken up with is pregnant with my child and all these other things, bro. Like, it really, it really was a lot to deal with for me. So I was like, you know what? I need to get myself on a level-headed, like, space and deal with whatever, I, won't, I don't want to say demons, mm -hmm. but deal with whatever, like, atrocities and shit that I have going on to be the best person I can be for not only myself, but for my seed and for everyone that's around me, you feel me? So I respect you talking about mental health and shit like that, bro. Wow. And I'm um, like, I don't know, just for the audience, because I have a lot of young people watching as well. Like, how was the process of finding a therapist uh, for you and how was the experience? All right, so I'm, I'm gonna say this, I don't brag about this job often, oh. but I was lucky. So me and Nixon, we both work for Starbucks. Oh. and um they offer free therapy um, 20 weeks a year. It's 20 weeks a year? I, I believe think if, so, yeah. I think if you yeah. have insurance, it's 20 weeks a year. And um, I went, went through it. I was like, all right. My biggest thing was I wanted a black therapist. I was like, I need a therapist that's going to somewhat understand certain things that I've been through. Mm -hmm. And I found this lady. She was amazing. It was telehealth. We would have conversations. Um, some weeks, bro, I, I didn't even have to, like within the first six weeks, we worked through everything I needed to as far as like, um, like I get anxious at times yeah. and I understand why we worked through that. Um, we worked through like certain depression that I had. And then a lot of it was just us holding conversations that were just like something that was, that allowed me to be that, like feel at peace. So like me and her had conversations about this is around when Clubhouse first came out too. We had a conversation one day about Clubhouse and Big Crit for like an hour. It wasn't even like a real therapy session. It was just us talking about music and um, things that we learned from being on Clubhouse. And she, um, she sent me stuff on time management mm. that was helpful. She sent me stuff on um, 
just different things that that she was like, okay, like you you have a child coming. Uh, I see that you're big on family, and you put a lot on. I put a lot on myself, bro. I'm not gonna lie. Mm. Like, I put the fucking world on my shoulders if it means making sure everybody around me is okay. Yeah. And that's something that is, it's not a problem, but it can be a problem. You feel me? Yeah. And that's something that she um she helped me work through. Like, you gotta be able to say fall back from shit. I'm like, nah, bro, I can't help you right now. I gotta help myself. And that was some shit that I had to deal with. So, yeah, finding finding a therapist was it was pretty easy for me. I got lucky. Wow. But I know, like, I have a few friends that um that been through multiple therapists and like, nah, bro, this person didn't work for me. That person didn't work for me. I was like, bro, you need to realize before you start looking for a therapist, what you're looking to get out of therapy. Oh, okay. Because if you don't know what you want to get out of therapy, you're wasting your time. Mm. And I don't mean to say it like that, but like. You're, bro, you're spending money on therapy. Like, I didn't, I didn't have to spend money on it, unfortunately, like, luckily. Yeah. But the average person is spending money on therapy. It's just coming out your insurance budget. So you want to make sure that you find a therapist that somewhat connects to what you're, what you're, what you're used to and make sure that you get the, um, the most out of it. That's what I think about it. Wow. Anything you want to touch on? Uh, I mean, I'm on the other side of the fence in a sense. I mean, I don't, I'm not against therapy, but I just, I haven't tried it out yet. Oh. Uh, I know I should, cause I'm, I can kind of relate to crack of just carrying the world on your shoulders and not yeah. thinking about yourself and making sure everyone else around you is okay. That, that's what I do at home. You know, now that mom passed, I make sure my dad's good. My sister, you know, the homies over here, because I know crack be going through it, so I always hit them up from time to time, like, yo, you good? You no, need God, anything? That's, that's one thing I could say about, especially Nixon, like, we, we do those check-ins on each other. Like, mm -hmm. we do it as the whole ECMG, like, we'll, like, we have a group chat, and we'll, like, at least one of us once a week, like, yo, how's everybody doing? But, like, that shit is important, bro. You need those friends that to check on you. Because the motherfuckers that seem the strongest be going through the most shit. So, them, those check-ins, they be important. Shit, you do it too, bro. You you hit us randomly like, yo, how's everybody doing? So, like, yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, but, and then for me, like, like, I did the bad thing. The negative part about it is that I, instead of turning to therapy, I turned to, to alcohol. Oh. So I became almost borderline alcoholic. I mean, it, it, it kind of was for a little bit because I was drinking every day. I was drinking every day at one point. And then on my days off, it would be a half a bottle of scotch. Mm. and it's kind of still like that like I still drink heavy on my days off but it's like I'd rather do that than go to therapy and then and then because of that that's how those last seven videos I dropped that's where all that came from mm. yeah it's like it, it's kind of me doing a therapy session with myself yeah. you know because I would just I would get heavily intoxicated and I would just write music like how I'm feeling at that moment and my mom's passing really, that shit really messed me up. So I, I wrote this whole, the, the seven song project, I called it my, the, the therapy session. Yeah. And it's a therapy session with myself and how I'm feeling and coming to terms with that I'm not dealing with it okay and that's okay. You know, you deal with it how you can and eventually time will heal. So. That's real. Yeah. So you don't feel like there is nothing else that affected you that you would need therapy for? Or just I mean, that type of guy? that's definitely a big part. I mean, you know, growing up, I got picked on and shit. Okay. You know, that, that's neither here nor there, though. Like, now I'm in an industry where people are going to talk shit about you all the time behind your back and in front of your face. And shit. that's okay with me now. But, like, I guess growing up, like, when you're a kid, you know, you want to be accepted, you know? And when people were calling you freckle face cartoon and throwing soda cans at your head when you're walking by in the hallway, you know, that doesn't make you feel good when you go home. So. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely, I, I definitely probably do need therapy. Just, just to at least talk to someone about my mom's passing. Because I haven't talked to anyone about it. Oh. Yeah, like you hear more about it in my music than you will from my mouth. Hmm. Yeah. And it's because I don't know how to talk about it but i do know how to write about it if that makes sense yeah that makes sense i mean i haven't been like fortunate to lose a parent yet but i lost my grandma and 
Yeah, that's a tough one too. I lost my great grandma yeah. um, in 2011, wow. uh, a couple of days before Christmas. And bro, I didn't celebrate Christmas until having the kid. So I get that. Like, especially like in the in the black community, bro, our grandmas are, are like parents. Yeah. So I, I understand that one. That's, that's the closest thing to losing a parent, right? Like for real. Mm. Like until I lost a parent, that was like my deepest hurt was losing my great grandma. Wow. So you losing your, your grandma, bro, you, you understand that hurt. Yeah. And she was the glue for the family. And mm -hmm. after that, it was like. Shit just fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I write music now, like, just to advocate more so for, like, mental health and also mm -hmm. just everybody's going through. Yeah. And That's like when Nixon first came to me with the therapy session, I was like, bro, I was like, bro, you don't even understand that you really gonna help a lot of people with this if they see it because, like, People going through it, bro, and like you said, it was him doing therapy on himself, and like he, um, when he dropped episode six, bro, I hit him con like right away, and I was like, bro, you really went deep on this one, cause he spoke about like losing his mom and all that shit, and um, I haven't spoke about losing my dad yet, like, so I told him I was like, bro, like I'm really proud of you for going and speaking on that shit, cause I know that shit was tough for you. Wow, yeah, that shit was tough as fuck. Oh shit. Well, I do appreciate y'all for showing up and showing out and sharing the experiences that you yeah, know, definitely, bro. Yeah. you guys learned from. And, you know, it's always appreciative because you guys didn't have to share. <laughs> nah, bro, that's what we're here for, bro. Yeah. Like, like I told you, I really fuck with you as a person, bro. Like as a as a musician as a, and as a human. So you asked me to come come like for yeah, sure. For real. <laughs> What's the point of the interview if you're not going to get to know us, though, you know? Yeah. We got to share everything. <laughs> <laughs> man, I appreciate you too, Nicks, man. Like, this is crazy. But, um. I know. We appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. That's yeah. facts. Yeah. And we, it's going to be a lot more in the future. I'm thinking about doing, like, a mental health fest. Just have, like, interactive uh, things going on, mm -hmm. panels, uh, people speaking, food, drinks, stuff for the kids. And, like. You know, I feel that. Yeah, just wanna. You know, that's that's our energy. Like we're big on feel, like feeding the community. Um, I'm bringing back my toy drive this December. I I didn't do it the last two years because I was dealing with my like my own situations with the family and trying to trying to recover from from losing the patriarch of my family Definitely. and having to step into that position to being the new patriarch and stuff like that. But yeah, we're bringing it back this year, bro. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm definitely going to support that. Yeah. No, we're coming hard as hell this year. Oh, yeah. Hard as hell. I love to hear that. <laughs> well, I appreciate y'all. Y'all uh, drop your social medias where they can find you. And uh, what, if you guys got any projects coming. No, oh, yeah, no. Um, you can find me on any social media, Sir Nixon, S-I-R-N-Y-X-O-N. Uh, I got the, the Red Viking dropping late July. And then sometime in October, it's going to be the Coffee Break EP. Oh. And that's with Crack and I. Coffee Break. Yeah, Coffee Break. All right, all right. Yeah. Um, I'm Crack Cobain. That's C-R-A-C-C-C-O-B-A-I-N on all social media platforms. Um, I'm working on the free lunch project. It's going to be out later on this year. I also have free lunch Fridays coming back uh, in the next couple weeks, probably. Um, I shot over 10 already. I'm trying to do 52 straight once I start dropping them. Okay, okay, so it's gonna talk be, to him. It's going to be solid. Um, like Nixon said, we got the Coffee Break Project. Uh, me and Spaz also have an EP that we're currently working on. It's on some player shit. Like, if you ever heard me and Spaz on a song together, y'all know how we speak. We, okay, okay. It's, it's, like, it's like Larry June meets fucking, meets Primo Rice, meets <laughs> Akeem Ali. Like, it's, it's that, that fly player shit. Oh, so, I like yeah, that. that's what, what I'm working on currently. Um, I'm getting ready to drop my first single, uh, this summer from the my, from the free lunch project, it's gonna be called Miami shit. It samples um, JLDD by Trick Daddy. Okay. And it's ignorant. Yeah. It's, it's fired though. Nixon, the, the <laughs> night Nixon heard the beat, he was like, "Oh, I know you gonna kill that." <laughs> and then I sent them, uh, I sent them, I sent like the first like four bars from it. He's like, "Oh man, I knew he was gonna get done with it." Touch. And then when I recorded it, everybody has heard that song so far. It's like, bro, you did your thing on that. That shit's hard as hell. Yeah. Well, I appreciate y'all and uh 
That's how we're going to close it out. See y'all next season. Yes, sir.